come down from the right? His piece is like a sedative. It literally is, you can feel it. And your circumstances haven't changed. You're still in the same situation, all those different things. But all of a sudden, it's like a spiritual warm blanket just comes down and wraps your whole body your heart and your mind and you just have this supernatural peace that comes from above it's the most amazing thing i only felt it a couple of times but uh, it's just super amazing and so again when people call the, the crisis line i let them know all the time that god's peace is going to come down right now your circumstances may not change but god's peace is there and it's like a supernatural center like literally you can feel it and so we'll pray for that brother rich anybody else my neck Okay, Sister Esther, for your neck. Yeah. Okay. Very good. And uh, for healing. And anybody else? Oh, just me, Juan Raul. I did, I called the, the lady who's in charge of, of the murals, and she told me it would take several months to to know if I'm going to get this mural, my funds for the mural. I thought that, I thought, you know, I, I, at least I knew it might, it might take three, two, well, two or four more months so I don't know, but they still, I still like to have prayer for this possible mule, because this will help okay. a lot. Okay, so we'll pray for that. And anybody else? Just your last week, Emily. Okay. <laughs> I think right. Mr. Leslie has been reading my mind. <laughs> okay. All right. And so is that it? So we can go into prayer and we'll go to our study. Robert, Robert, Robert. Say that again. Robert can always use prayers. Okay, for and for what, brother? So we each continue to do God's will. Okay. This is Brother Ed. Good afternoon, Amen. Glad to be here. This just got on a problem. Sorry, it's not a little late. Uh, I'd like to pray for a hedge of protection and a continual strength for him and I'm starting to help. Uh, okay. I'm going to make it. Thank you. Okay, so you're asking for a hedge of protection, right? Is that what you Okay, we'll okay. pray for you right now. Okay. <laughs> All right. And uh, so, for West, so I have a... Uh, Thank you for the for the amazing blessing she's given me. All right. Amen. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and pray here. Here we go. Father, uh, we do come before your throne of grace, Lord, and we're just so grateful and thankful that you gathered us here. Uh, the most thing that we're thankful for is that your word says, for two or three are gathered to know that you are here. And we believe this in all our heart, Lord God. This is like your little campfire meeting, Lord God. Not as formal as the Bible study, but we're sitting on logs, Lord God. Camp before the throne of heaven, Lord God. And I believe that you're sitting on one of those logs that are with us, with the Lord Jesus, Lord. And your Holy Spirit among us, Lord God, as we share what you have done in our lives, Lord God. We just thank you for this. Father, would you lift up Brother Richie, Lord? I think he said it best, Lord. Even when he was in prison, he was free. Because whom the sun sets free, he is free indeed. Lord, we just pray that you would give him that same boldness, that same fire, that same passion to serve you, to love you, to draw near to you. And that you would give him that peace that surpasses all understanding. Lord, grab him in your loving arms and uh, lead him in your ways, oh God. Father, we lift up Sister uh, Esther for healing upon her neck. We pray the Lord that uh, you would look down. And with your uh, loving hands, Lord God, your nail pierced hands, that you, Lord Jesus, will touch her neck and that she would be healed. Lord, we do lift up our brother Juan Raul with this mural project. They said it's going to take another three months for them to decide. Lord, we ask that if you be willing, Lord, that it would not only take less time, but that if you be willing, that you would allow it to go to him. And that he would give you the glory and the honor, Lord God, for when they say what a beautiful mural this is, that he would say, it's my God who blessed me with these talents and give me that glory, Lord, and that honor. And he, Lord, he would have a little provision from this, Lord. Father, we do lift up Sister Leslie's uh, daughter, Emily, to you. We ask for her soul, that you would save her, bring that conviction of heart, remorse and repentance and the faith to believe. Also pray for my mother, Rosie's daughter, uh, Delia. 
for the same thing that you would save our soul. Also, Angel and also my uh, junior's friends and also my daughter, Lord. Uh, please, oh God, have mercy upon her. Lord, I also ask for mercy to know that she had an operation there on her hands for that arthritis. Lord, I just pray that somehow that you would bring such healing that she would be surprised that she would remember that I texted her and said that I was praying for her, Lord, and that you may be glorified and she may see, Lord God, that you are a God who lives, Lord God, and heals and touches. You are a friend and our giver and our savior and our provider. Just ask you for these things. Lord, we pray for Brother Robert that uh, it's your continued will be done in his life. Lord, Brother Eddie is looking for hedges of protection. And Lord, we pray that you put hedge of protection on his heart and mind and soul. Send angels before him and behind him and to the left and to the right to protect him, Lord, and be with him. And lastly, Brother Wes is uh, just thanking us, thanking you, Lord God, for all the blessings. Thank you for the download, for the direction, for the time. Uh, for all the provision, everything that you provided for him to get this uh, this piece done, Lord God, so we can move on to the next uh, segment, Lord God. And hopefully, Lord God, if you be willing, that you will lead us into that promised land of manufacturing and sales, Lord. So we ask that you would please be with us on this call and be glorified as we share your word and hear testimonies of what you've done. And we ask for these things in Jesus' most holy name. Amen. 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 All right. And so um, just a couple of things before we start. So one of the things is that uh, we were going to, uh, everyone was going to try to make it to church, remember, and uh, pray for the church service. And so did anybody actually make it in and, and pray for a church service? No, we try to go next week. I want to go to Okay. Remember, these are like assignments, right? That was supposed to be a homework, a, a makeup assignment, because no one or half the people didn't do the other assignment, which was the YouTube videos. And so, well, did anybody send out? Church. What was that? I did pray. So, well, I can't talk to church. I don't have a post church in the area, so. Okay. Okay, 
Okay, wonderful. Okay, so that's a testimony right there. You see how God answered that? They actually did it, and God answered. Because I'm just telling you, people are, are Christians, and they don't even get baptized like two, three, five, six, seven years later. But these people just were there, and they just by the Spirit of God. They just went and got baptized. That's the move of God. That's what I'm talking about. When you ask the Lord and you pray, He shows up. And these kinds of things happen. I've seen it all the time. All you got to do is honor the Lord. Take that step and go do this for Him. Right? And see how He answers. He always answers the prayers that are about His Son. It's just the most amazing thing. So thank you for sharing that. Uh, the last thing is that, uh, well, two more things before we get into the study. So uh, don't forget that, you know, the initial assignment was to send out those links to people. And so hopefully I see that uh, the views are climbing and this is just part of, we're not, we're not going to do this forever, but just, you know, this first couple of weeks because the Lord is launching this ministry. And so again, uh, it's a YouTube video ministry with these testimonies that are being recorded with the photos that Sister Leslie is recording these and Jackie, when she gets back, she's the one that's been posting them with the photos and everything. And so again, uh, when she comes back, they're going to run, uh, we're going to run, the Lord is going to run a Google campaign. So when people are searching for uh, Christian testimony, it's going to bring up this YouTube link. And so the key is just to get uh, people looking at these testimonies. And the reason is not for the testimony sake, it's not for the channel sake. And so people know how very real God is. See, like if you go to the churches, you never hear testimonies, very rarely. And it's just so amazing that it amazes me that they don't share testimonies. You know, that's like going to a car dealership and you're looking for cars, but you never see a car. You got to have the actual car so you can drive it. And that's what the testimonies are. But if you hear someone telling them, telling you, this is what my God did to me. He showed up. Right? And so that's what's so important is to, is to have those testimonies. And so, again, that's what the purpose is behind these, this video uh channel. It's called Tuesday, Te what's it called? Tuesday Testimony. And so they're being uploaded there. And so, again, you know, do your best to get these out. I think there's seven of them listed out there. And just, you know, whichever one you feel the Lord, you don't have to send the same one to everybody. You can send different ones. If they're younger and they're looking to get their life on track, maybe the one that Jacob recorded. Uh, if there's someone to come out of prison, the one that Suki recorded. Uh, someone who, who is having a hard time, remember the one Sister Rachel recorded. Um, yeah, the one that my mom recorded, Rosie. And about the death of her son, we have Sister Leslie who's going to be posted next week. And so they're all right there. Yeah, my testimony, all these different ones. Just look through them and just, uh, you know, get them out. So then that way it increases awareness. Okay, and then the last thing, I just wanted to share this with you. And again, you know, I wouldn't share this necessarily with people. But uh, this is just for your knowledge because if you share this with people, it's good. they're going to go to it. And so... Uh, just about an hour ago, you know, about two hours ago, I got a call from a, a young lady. Her name was Tierra. And she, she said that the Lord gave her, you know, a word. And so she wanted this prayer on this. And so, you know, of course, that's when my ears perk up, right? Because you have to have spiritual discernment. And so the word was that there's a movie that's out right now. I think it was, she said it was called The Conjuring or something. And so the, the Lord made it clear if they watch this movie, that they're going to get possessed or they're they're in danger of being possessed. And so, so I just prayed, you know, I didn't feel, you know, the Lord confirming it or anything, but the one thing I remember is that about three days ago, we did get a call from someone who said, I think it was that movie, that they went to go watch some movie at some theater, and as they left the theater, a spirit followed them, and now the woman is possessed. And it was after the call, or during the call, that I remembered that. It just happened like three days ago. So to me, it's a confirmation. And so see how the enemy is attacking? And again, we even heard from just... What was that? So did she get frightened or something? Or she just... No, no, she happen. got possessed. She felt something inside of her. We had to pray for her. I had to call Brother Emilio after and text him and have her call and, and pray for her to get that spirit out of her. So, you know, we shouldn't be watching those kinds of movies. So the Bible says... That we, you know, whatever is pure, whatever is noble, whatever is genuine, whatever honest, all those sort of things, those are the things we're supposed to meditate on. We're not supposed to go and watch glorification of Satan's army. But people are doing that. And for whatever reason, I'm not quite sure, but if this was, if this was truly was the word of God, 
if people are going to be leaving now, they're, you know, being tormented by the spirits and some people possess. And that's what she said the Lord showed her. And I'm just telling you, three days before then, someone had called with that same issue. They said they went to this movie, they saw it, and a spirit followed them, and now it entered the, the, the wife. It was a couple. These are very serious things. They ain't stop playing. See, the church plays around. We play around playing church and talking about you wearing our little Christian symbols and our little Christian church Bibles. Satan doesn't play around. He is after souls and he's getting them. These are serious things. And so I just wanted to, you know, share that with you just in case you know someone you, you could kind of, but if you don't just tell people not to go to this movie because you're hurt, I don't think that all it's going to do is kind of, you know, uh, bring that up in their mind. And so again, you can pray to the Lord how he wants you to do that. But for your knowledge, we are not supposed to be going to these things for sure, Christians, and even the you know people that are unbelievers, because I'm telling you, there's something wrong with that movie. And so again, someone just called and said that the Lord made that clear, and then uh, three days before it happened to somebody. And they don't know each other. These are just random calls that came into the suicide line. Okay, so we're going to be in Genesis chapter eight, and then we're going to get to uh, the, the testimonies. And so uh, we got two testimonies tonight. Uh, and so we're running already a little behind, so we're going to have to move super pretty quickly here. So we're going to be in Genesis chapter 8, 18. So Genesis is the first book in the Bible. And so let's see, Esther, can you read today? Yes, I can. Okay, and Juan Ro, can you read? Yes. Okay, Robert, can you read? Yes, yeah, Robert. Okay, and Sophia? Okay, and Star? Yes, I can read. Okay, Mr. Leslie? Yeah. Okay, and uh, how about uh, Eddie? Are you able to read Eddie? Yes, yes, I can't, but I'm sorry. Okay, uh, Brother Todd is on. He's sharing tonight, but I don't know if he can read. Can you read, Todd? Uh, sure. Okay, and then Michelle? And then Michaela. Okay, so here we go. Like always, we always read one chapter that has to do with the testimony, and we're going to go from there. Okay, so uh, Genesis chapter 18. Is everybody there? Say amen. 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 Okay, amen. With good, strong uh, voices, passionate. And I can read it. Okay? And so, can you read Genesis chapter 18? Amen. Yes. The Lord appeared to Abraham near the great trees of man. While he was sleeping at the entrance to his tent in the heat of the day, Abraham looked up and saw three men standing nearby. When he saw them, he hurried from the entrance of his tent to meet them and bowed low to the ground. Oh, okay, here we go. So, okay, I'm feeling my mic is turning out a little bit, but I think we're okay now. So, here it is. Okay, did everybody get that? It's verse 1 and 2. And so, it says, Then the Lord appeared to him by the terebinth trees in Mambu, as he was sitting in the tent door in the heat of the day. So, he lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, three men were standing by him. So, this is the Lord, and I believe this is the Lord Jesus, because the Lord Jesus said, No one has seen the Father. Your seen his form, okay? And when he saw them, he ran from the tent door to meet them and bowed himself to the ground, right? Uh, verse 3 and 4, that would be one. Okay, I'm a, I'm, a little, I'm a little lost, but in Genesis what? Chapter 18. Oh, chapter 18, okay, got it, okay. Genesis 18 what? Verses 3 and 4. Okay, got it. And then... Lord, if I have now found favor in your sight, do not pass on by your servant. Please let a little water be brought and wash your feet and rest yourselves under the tree. Okay. Mm. Okay, here we go. So look at this. So this is Abraham. Can you tell Abraham was a friend of God and he loved God? So the first thing yeah. he says is, is, my Lord, if I have now found favor in your sight, right, do not pass by your servant. 
That's the way you talk. They're they talking about better making it about God, your service. Please let a little water be brought and wash your feet. You remember when the Lord Jesus went into the Pharisee's house? And he was there, and then he was eating, and then all of a sudden a woman came in who was a sinner, and then the Pharisee began to say to himself, he said, man, if this guy was a true prophet, he would know what kind of woman this is, because she's a, she's a hooker, right? And then, but before he could even say anything, the Lord Jesus already knew his thoughts. And he said, Simon, I have something to say to you. And he said, stay on. He said, when I came in, you didn't wash my feet, you didn't pour oil. On my, on my forehead or greet me or give me a kiss, none of those things. But this woman has washed my feet with her tears and has dried them with her hair. And then he goes on to say, he tells them a story, which one uh, loves more? The one that's forgiven a little bit or the one that's forgiven more? And he said, well, I guess the one that's forgiven more. And he said, you, you, you judge correctly. And he looks at the woman and he says, Woman, your sins, although there are many, are forgiven you, right? And so again, see how striking that is. The Pharisee wouldn't even wouldn't even ignore, wouldn't even wash his feet, wouldn't anoint none of those things. Give him a kiss. Well, look at Abraham. He's running. He runs up to him and says, "Hey, can you please sit down and eat with us? Let me wash you and wash you up and wash your feet and get you some food." Now, look at how he treats him. This is like a he treats him like a top-notch restaurant. He actually stands there. While he's eating, why? Because this is the Lord Jesus, and he's come down with two angels. Okay, first, can you imagine having dinner serving the Lord Jesus Himself, God Himself? He's there at your house eating. Verse five and six. That would be Robert. Verse five and six. And I will bring you. Morsels of bread that you may refresh yourself. Heart after heart after that you may pass by in in astonishment as you have come to your servant. They said, do, do as you have said. But Abraham hurried into the tent. Sarah and said, quickly, make ready three measurements of fine meat. Fine meal, knead it, and make cakes. Okay, here we go. You see how it's given on the VIP treatment here? Why? Because that's God himself. And he said, uh, so he says, the Lord Jesus says, do as you have said. So Abraham hurried. He didn't walk, he didn't live casual. He hurried into the tent and told Sarah, his wife, to said, quickly, make three measures of fine meal, not ready to meal, fine meal, knead it and make cakes. This adds so much meaning to that passage in John 56. Do you remember uh, when the, the Pharisees were saying that, you know, that, uh, they were saying they were children of Abraham, and the Lord Jesus said, well, Abraham didn't do what you did. Goes on to say, he says, Your father Abraham rejoiced in my day, and he saw it and was glad. Then the Jews said to him, You're not even 50 years old, and you have seen Abraham? And then Jesus said to them, Most assuredly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. That's the great and high holy name of, of God. And so he was telling them, Yeah, not only did I see him, I am God. I am that I am. That's what he was saying. Then that's when they picked up stone. It just doesn't it color that verse so well. Now that you see how the encounter went, how Abraham saw him and he ran, and he wanted to make him. He wanted to wash his feet. He wanted to give him water to drink, and he wanted to sit him down and prepare a nice little dinner for him. It's just beautiful. That's the true friend of God right there. If you look, God always calls Abraham his friend. Okay. Now think about this. If this was the modern church. And the Lord shows up, it might have got a little different. It might have went something like this. Hey, Lord, uh, thank you for coming by, but you know, I just, uh, I'm just, I got some plans here. You know, I'm just a little busy with this work project. You know, Lord, and later tonight, my my, my favorite sports team is going to be playing on TV. And so, Lord, I just kind of kind of want to do that. And, you know, maybe, maybe tomorrow night we can schedule a little something together. Why? Because we 
we just don't have the fear of God like we used to. You know, we have an opportunity to sit and be communion with God Almighty all the time. He may not be present, but we can go to Him in prayer and just, just spend time with Him. But we put our mouth all the time. I know I do. And so we just got to get better at that. We got to be like Abraham and say, Lord, I'm just having the fact like right now, if there was a contract that's sold and by God's grace, it, it's signed. There's always such a headache to get it through. And I look at the email, they have all these questions, all these different things. And I'm like, that's why I don't like doing these contracts because they want they want so much different information out there. But anyways, I was driving to the store real quick before Bible study and all of a sudden, I said, you know, I'm just going to play Christian music. That makes me feel better. And all of a sudden, the Spirit of God fell. Why? Because you can always go to the Lord to make you feel better. He'll just take care of you. You just got to worship Him and sing to Him. And just draw near to him, and all your troubles just vanish away. Okay, verses 7 and 8, that would be Sophia. And Abraham ran to a herd, took a tender and good path, gave it to a young man, and he hastened to prepare it. So he took butter and milk in the calf which he had prepared, and set it before them, and he stood by them under the tree as they ate. Okay, so he, he took the tender calf. Uh, gave it to the young man, told him to prepare it, and then he took butter and milk. Man, he's going top notch. But remember, these guys lived in just uh, out of the deserts, right? And he had just, you know, uh, tents and those different things. And he, and he prepared it, and then he stood by them underneath the, the tree. Verse 9 and 10, that would be star. Okay. And they said unto him, Where is Sarah, they wa- the wife? And he said, Behold, in the tent. And he said, I will certainly return unto thee according to the time of life. And lo, Sarah, the wife, shall have a son, and Sarah heard it in the tent door, which was to find him. Okay, go ahead and read verses 11 and 12. Now Abraham and Sarah were old and well stricken in the age, and it increased. To be with Sarah after the man near a uh, near a uh, woman near off woman. Sorry about that. Oh, sorry. Wait, that over off. I'm confused. Okay, let me just go ahead and read it here. Now Abraham and Sarah were old, well advanced in age, and Sarah had passed the age of childbirth. Childbearing. Therefore, Sarah laughed within herself, saying, "After I have grown old." Shall I have pleasure, my Lord, speaking of Abraham, being old also? So here's the question, and we've already covered this before. Does that sound like faith? No. No. No, that's the question. It doesn't sound like faith. She, but, you know, it, it, it's so funny because she, she kind of laughs, and she like, she's like, Cause she's like, okay, Abraham at this point is like 99 years old. I think she's 90. When was the last time you saw a 90 year old uh, getting pregnant and giving birth? Never. Right? It doesn't happen, right? Not in this millennial. What was that? Not in this millennial, brother. <laughs> yeah, absolutely not, right? And so that's why she kind of laughed to herself, right? But we know this. You don't have to turn to it, but I'm just going to read it. In Hebrews eleven seventeen, it says, "By faith, Sarah herself also received strength to conceive a seed, and she bore a child when she was past the age, because she judged him faithful who had promised." So we have one scripture saying that she was she had faith. We have another scripture showing that she didn't have faith, right? And so when there looks like there is a contradiction. Then it, both are true. If, the, if you're reading it correctly and it's in context and they appear to be uh, contradicting to each other, then the answer is they're both are true, which is the case here. She started off with not faith. She didn't believe. But something's going to happen and she's going to see God move. That's the power of the testimony. And when she sees it, she's going to say, hey, this guy don't play around. If he can do that, he can also get me pregnant. That's what she's going to rationalize. That's why it's so important to have testimony. When people hear what God has done for you, when you show them pictures and say, hey, look, I used to be a crackhead, 
Look at over here. I'm over here now, regional vice president. People are like, hey, I believe that. You got the photos. I believe God can do these things. And it gives them faith. Because without faith, it is impossible to please God. Okay, verse 13 and 14, that would be just a lesson. And the Lord said to Abraham, Why did Sarah laugh, saying, Shall I surely bear a child since I am old? Is anything too hard for the Lord? At the appointed time, I will return to you according to the time of life, and Sarah shall have a son. Go ahead and read 15. But Sarah denied it, saying, I did not laugh, for she was afraid. And he said, No, but you did laugh. Okay. You see the tenderness of the Lord here? And so, again, she, without faith, she, she didn't, like, mock him. She didn't uh, gain faith. She just simply laughed at her herself. And she said, I'm like, I'm going to have a kid. Come on. Right? She just thought that to herself. And, but he called her on it. And so he, he said, uh, but Sarah denied saying, I didn't laugh. For she was afraid of him. Why? Right? Because this is, this is God himself, God the Son. And he said, no, but you did laugh. He called her out on it. Okay, let's see what happens. Verse 16 and 17, that would be Eddie. Then the men rose from there and looked toward the sun. And Abraham went with them. He sent them on the way. And the Lord said, shall I hide you from Abraham for what I, for what I am doing? Okay, uh, let's do 17 and 18. That would be Brother Todd. Mm -hmm. um, 17 and 18. Okay. Um, and the Lord said, shall I hide from Abraham what I am doing? Since Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation, and all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him. Okay, go ahead and read 19 through 21. Okay. For I Actually, have wait, wait, wait. 19, 19 through 20. Yeah, let's 20. see here. Oh, 19 through 20. No, let's see here. Uh, let's see here. Amen. Okay, because we're running short of time, let's go ahead and read. You read 19 through 32. Oh, okay. Okay. Oh, okay. Um, for I have known him in order that he may command his children and his household after him, that they keep the way of the Lord, to do righteousness and justice, that the Lord may bring to Abraham what he has spoken to him. And the Lord said, because of the outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah is great, and because their sin is very grave, I will go down now and see whether they have done altogether according to the outcry against it that has come to me. And if not, I will know. Then the men turned away from there and went toward Sodom. But Abraham stood before the Lord. And Abraham came near and said, Would you also destroy the righteous with the wicked? Suppose there were 50 righteous within the city. Would you also destroy the place and not spare it for 50 righteous that were in it? Far be it from you to do such a thing as this, to slay the righteous with the wicked, so that the righteous should be as the wicked. Far be it from you. Shall not the judge of all the earth do right? So the Lord said, if I find in Sodom 50 righteous within the city, then I will spare, um, then I will, oh, oh, th then I will spare all the place for their sakes. Then Abraham answered and said, indeed, now I who am but dust and ashes have taken it upon myself to seek the Lord. Suppose there were 50 less than righteous, would you destroy the city for lack of five and so he said i if i find there 45 i will not destroy it and there and and he spoke to him yet again and said suppose there was to be 40 uh, righteous found there and he said i will not do it for the sake of 40 righteous people then he said let not the lord be angry and i will speak suppose 30 righteous should be found there so he said i will not do it if i find 30 righteous there and he said, indeed, now I have taken it upon myself to speak to the Lord. Suppose 20 righteous should be found there. So he said, I will not destroy it for the sake of 20 righteous people. Then he said, let not the Lord be angry and I will speak. But once more, suppose 10 righteous should be found there. And he said, I will not destroy it for the sake of 10. So the Lord went his way as soon as he had finished speaking with Abraham and Abraham returned to his place. Okay, so here we go. So 
what's happening here? He tells him he's going to come. He came down. The angels have cried out and said, hey, these guys are sinning upon sinning something uh, extraordinary. So now the Lord Jesus himself says, I want to come and see it myself. So that's where he's going. And he says, and if it's like they say, I'm going to destroy these cities, Sodom and Gomorrah, which he did. He destroyed them so well, and I've been to Israel, that they still can't find them. But interesting, where they think Sodom and Gomorrah was they, they, it's covered completely in sulfur. That's how hot it burned. Okay? But there's two things. Remember, Abraham is a friend of God. And so because he's a friend, he can actually, you know, again, we're just men. And God sometimes looks for us to have that fellowship with him. And he says this. Look at verse 25. Look at the genuineness. But he says this with all humility. He says, he says, far be it from you. He says, would you also destroy the place and not spare it for the 50 righteous that were in it? Verse 25. Far be it from you to do such a thing, to slay the righteous with the wicked, so that the righteous should be as the wicked. Far be it from you. And then he goes on to say this. Look at this. Look at the relationship he has with them. Shall not the judge of all the earth do right? imagine that kind of relationship where you could he's talking to God frankly and think shall not you the God of all the earth do what's right now God is going to do what's right all the time because whatever God does is what right. but he was allowing this to bring this out of Abraham so it can be recorded in the scriptures this is the kind of relationship you can have we can be very frank and say Lord I'm not understanding Lord maybe you can help me understand this but this is it. So I want to share something else about it. And then he begins to negotiate. If there was 40, if there was uh, 30, if there was 20, if there was 10, right? And he gets down the Lord down to 10. This is what's so interesting. So uh, Saturday I had a, an appointment, and so I had to work off the contract and everything. And then uh, I think it was Sunday night, but I, I was just so tired. I thought it was Sunday morning. And so Sunday morning comes. I spent a little time reading the Bible. And then I was going to do those, the contract that involved these drawings and everything. And then, but then all of a sudden, I just felt like, the, you know, that I needed to do God's work first, which is the Bible study for Tuesday. So I wanted to get that out of the way. And so I did this passage, and the Lord led me, because I was thinking, what what can we teach on a testimony? So he led me to this passage here. So I just did it. I didn't do all the notes, but I just did most of it, right? And then I just happened to turn it on TV to the gym, and Jimmy Swagger was on. And so they do this thing, uh, it's called study in the Word. And then all of us, they were talking about Daniel and Daniel's prayer. Well, we just covered the Friday before. And I was like, oh, that's interesting. And then this one pastor says this. He said, I like the, the comment that you played. Because he did a commentary, and I have it, in Genesis 18. And he's talking about this same passage. I'm like, wait a minute. Is he talking about this same passage? And then he, showed, he said something I had never seen before. So here we go. Abraham is asking and pleading for Sodom and Gomorrah. And the Lord saying, okay, I'll do it. And he says, what about this? And he says, I'll do it. And what about this? And he says, I'll do it. And he says, but what about this? Will you do even this? And he says, I'll do it. But I had never noticed it, but this is something, and I'm telling you, those Pentecostals, they know God. This is what he said. Abraham stopped asking before God stopped giving. Do you understand that? Yeah. Yeah. Do you understand that? Abraham stopped asking. He, he, God did never said no to him. Not one time. And he stopped asking before stopped, God stopped giving. That was, a, that was such a powerful revelation. Look at it in the scriptures. God never told him no. Abraham just stopped asking. When he got down to 10, he said, that's good enough. Uh -huh. But he could have kept asking. And you never know what he could have said, okay. You know, when he brought that out, I was like, let me look at the script. I thought, that's true. Abraham stopped asking before, stop, before God stopped giving. And it just shows the greatness and the vastness of God's mercy. We can keep going to him and just keep going to him and keep going to him. It was, I don't know, to me, it was just such an epiphany. When I, when I heard that, I was like, man, God just showed me that. Because what are, the, what are the odds? And so anyways, that's what it is. Okay, so Genesis 19, everybody skip forward to Genesis 19. 
And uh, Michelle is going to be our reader here. Hey, Amen. When you're there, Genesis 19, we're going to go to verse 27. Amen. Okay. Okay. So wait a minute. Before you read, you know, let's get the story now. So here we go. The Lord comes down, and he's in a good mood, right? And he's over here, and he's with his friend Abraham. And Abraham is out of tension. He's running. He's over here getting this, this cow. He's getting, you know, butter, water, all these things for them. The two men are angels that are with him. They're accompanying him. And they're there, and they eat. And so now he says that Abraham, Sarah's going to have a, a, a son. Sarah doesn't believe him. She laughs. He calls her on it, but he says, you are going to have a son. He didn't take it away. Right? And so she's going to have a son. But again, she doesn't have the faith yet. And so now he goes off and he tells, he tells the angel, should I tell Abraham what I'm about to do? So he tells him, I'm about to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. Those are like, that's like New York City and Boston. Boom. I'm just tired of these guys. I'm just going to do it all. Well, let's, let's change it. Let's say New York City because I know that Brother Richie and, and, and Brother Manuel up there. But let's just say New York City and, and L.A., for example. <laughs> and so that's what he's going to do, right? And so he says, why? And he tells them why. And then he says, what about if there's some righteousness in there? So he takes them down all the way to 10. Before, remember, he stopped asking before he stopped saying yes, okay? And so now he knows that God is going to go over there and destroy this these city if he doesn't find 10 righteous. Okay? Think about it. He must have went back and told Sarah because he, he, we came back and I'm sure Sarah would have asked, who was that? And he would have, he would have told him, that's, that's the Lord. That's him. That's the Lord, the God of all the universe. He came down to eat at our little tent. See, the Lord Jesus said he's meek and humble. And Amen. so again, she must have asked, What's he here for? He says he's going to destroy these two big cities, Sodom and Gomorrah. And she's like, oh, right? Still not having the faith that you can have, you're going to have a son. Here comes the testimony. Okay, Genesis 27 and 28. Michelle, can you read that? Yes, it's, it's 19 though, right? Yes, yeah, Genesis 19, 27, and 28. Okay. Early the next morning, Abraham hurried to the place where he had stood in the presence of the Lord. He looked down at Sodom and Gomorrah and the whole valley and saw smoke rising from the land like smoke from a huge furnace. Right there. Okay. So he goes over there and now he knows that he did not find ten righteous. Because he smoked it all up. He burned it all. This was like a nuclear explosion. It says, look at this. It says, and towards all the land of the thing he saw, and behold, the smoke of the land which went up like the smoke of a furnace. Black, thick smoke. When God's looking to destroy something, he is not playing games. By the way, and I shared this before, the Lord made it clear that he was going to destroy the U.S. like a Sodom and Gomorrah. This was like about 10, 11 years ago. And it's coming. And so you see all these people, especially in June, when they call it Pride, uh, Pride Month, and all these different things that they mock God. You're going to see it when he destroys it all, just like Sodom and Gomorrah, because God's not having it. He's going to move us out before he does that, though, right? That's one of the things he made clear. He's going to move us out. I don't know where we're going to go. Amen. He say that we, we were going to go to different areas of confinement. I think that's what we're headed to. But he is going to destroy parts of the U.S. At least part, I know that part for sure. And he confirmed it over and over. I saw the angels going into the U.S. I saw it all. And so, okay, here we go. So now, Sarah, the day before, he, was, he told her, hey, he's thinking about destroying this whole thing if you don't find ten righteous. And guess what? He destroyed it. And so now Sarah says, hey, man, this guy keeps his word. God does not lie. He does not exaggerate. And if he said he was going to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah and he destroyed it, Maybe he's going to give me a son. And that's what gave her the faith. Because it goes on to say, again, by faith, Sarah herself also conceived, received, receiving strength to conceive seed, and she bore a male, a male child when she was past the age. Here it is, because she judged him to be faithful. She judged him faithful who had promised. See, after she saw it happen, and it was a testimony, 
that faith came in, and then she, from that faith, she received strength to conceive. And she had a son by the name of Isaac. And from Isaac, he had uh, a, a two sons, one Esau and one Jacob, where we get the 12 tribes of Jacob. Okay, you see the power of testimony? You read, sometimes we read the verse, and the Bible says, faith comes by hearing, hearing comes by the word of God. But I'm just telling you, it's when you cement these things in with the actual testimony of like Brother Richie's being brother Richie's brother being brought being brought back from the from the grave. Of my mother Rosie's testimony of her crying out saying, God, I need something from you that says I'm yours and then all of a sudden he provides a ring that says Jesus right there in the dirt. Right? Brother uh my son Jacob's testimony when he was, you know, Reading and God spoke to him, said, I'm going to get your crap out. And he got him out. All these things, they just, they cement and they encourage people to have faith in a very real and near God. That's the power of testimony. And that's why we're doing these, these testimony two things. Okay, so we're going to have two testimonies here. Uh, the first one is going to be Brother Robert. And we know Brother Robert, he, he, he lives there in Turlock. And I sent out a couple of pictures. And so he's just going to kind of share. Uh, how he came to faith, and uh, what he does for the Lord. And so, Brother Robert, can you uh, begin to share? Yes, I'd love to. Praise God for, uh, for every everything in my breath, every step, <laughs> every illness. If it wasn't for him guiding me, I wouldn't be here today. I moved here to Sherlock in 2010. I had been hemorrhaging some blood at my high school sweetheart. She called my dad and said, you know, Steve, you need to let your son move in with you. And he agreed, so she moved me up here to Sherlock, uh, Papa Lander. Um, I was collecting my Social Security at that time. I was already disabled. So on the first of every month at midnight, I would get paid. So I would walk to about a mile and a quarter to Denny's to have myself a breakfast uh, off the $2 menu. So as I'm doing this, some of the homeless people, I started inviting them. And they started coming, and I was feeding them uh, off the $2 menu. So as the time progressed, there was two people that were wanting to be leaders of the community and had their own uh, nonprofit organization. So they asked me to help them get started. So the only thing I could do is by example and start, got, I got into to the word and they helped me choose a name, Fired Up, because we're fired up God. 18 months later, you know, I'm feeding 75, 76 people a month off of my Social Security check. Everything that I've spent, it's been because of God. He already knew that I was going to be here helping the homeless. As time progressed, I, I got involved with the, getting the paperwork for the CO1 dash three um, um, nonprofit organization and helping them to get the paperwork, I started, you know, saying, well, okay, I'm not going to run this thing. You guys are going to run it because you know what you guys need as homeless people. You know, everybody's giving you things that are leftovers or garbage. You know what you need to, to survive and be treated equally. So I became also the advocate here to, in Turlock. My, when I was staying at my parents' house, my dad and my stepmothers, um, people were coming up and asking if they could talk with me or pray with me or they needed prayers or just advice. So my stepmother was getting very nervous uh, because homeless people were coming to the door. So my dad asked me, you know, if you're going to have these people over, you're going to have to move. So I found the house two doors down, and it was a, it was a drug house. But you know, I was in there for about three months, and I wake up from um, in the hospital at Emmanuel Hospital. I had low potassium. I, they had to take me out of the bathroom um, by ambulance to Emmanuel Hospital. But when I got home. A gentleman says, you, you don't live here anymore. You know, we, we already rented your room out. So I was in the hospital about three days. So I went to, you know, on all your stuff's over at your dad's place. So I went over there. He said, well, we, it's all in the storage unit. You know, so you, you know, can't live here. We don't have any room for you. 
So I started living out on the street, and then a month later, uh, that was August uh, 25th, I had a stroke. I was doing jail ministry already. Catching the, the bus from Turok, going all the way in Pedesco, sitting there just to see one person, homeless person, so I could, you know, bring them God, read the Bible with them. Just a short visit. Uh, I might get two or three people in one day. I'd be there from early in the morning till late at night to see one or two people, you know, prayers and uh, guidance. When I had the stroke, right, right before I had the stroke, this young man's cousin asked me, can you help my cousin? He needs to be on Social Security. So I agreed, yeah, I'll, I'll help him. One day, I had my news. You know, young man's uh, arrested and uh, accosted this young girl under 18. He smacked on him that he was just doing what all the other guys were talking about. He did it. But not, no... Nothing shameful in it. She, uh, so I looked up what his uh, charges were. It was a misdemeanor. So I bailed him out. And it took us a year to prove his innocence. They had him in the hospital. He put him in sight uh, and his body up. And he, we got him back um, onto his social security. Then he wanted to move home with his parents and stock it. So I... Joe was happy to let him do that. Three times he moved out, and he called me up and said, Robert, come get me. I, you know, I, I don't want to be here anymore. So I come back, and I pick him up, and I you know, bring him back to Turlock. So he started staying at the men's shelter, and I did too. More and more homeless people were just needing the word. So how can you refuse them when they want to hear the word? I'm trying to be an example. It, it just, you know, nobody can discourage me. My faith is unshakable. Well, I say I'm joyfully blessed no matter what. This is true. Even hard times are blessings. We, we look, look at them as bad things. No, they're all good things because God gets you through each and every day no matter what. Amen. That's what I met Esther on the street and has. Yeah, she, she seen what I was doing with trying to help uh, Garrett. He wanted to go to church. I was like, yes, somebody who wants to go to church. So we started going to his home church. And that's where I got saved through them, through the Provo Baptist Church. We didn't have a vehicle at the time. And then I bought a vehicle from one of the homeless people because uh, he said he was an alcoholic and he's sure it's going to get taken away from him or get into a wreck. So I bought it for like $300. A couple months later, I finally got it home and um, was working on it when the pastor asked us, well, we need somebody to stay here on the property and be night, you know, night watchmen. So we started staying there, and that, that way we should go to church every day of the, of the week. We are always ready to do it. Um, in Turlock, they used to, before they had this Turlock Gospel Mission, they, the Gospel Mission was housing the women in a church during the winter times. So they'd have one week at, at each church here in Turlock. It's uh, known in the Guinness Book of World Records for having the most churches per capita. So, you know, there was plenty of room, the churches for them to stay one week in, in one church, one week in another church. That was just the winter time. Once they got the Turlock Gospel Mission built their day center, now you know, it's a women's center, and there's a men's uh, housing, which is called the We Care Program. These things are good, but they're still lacking the compassion that God needs them to be. And I was going to the city hall meetings and getting involved with the city. And I told the city council, because somebody offered to put up three porta potties in Toronto for the homeless to work by two or three people, each one man a toilet, and get paid for it. But the city would not allow us to do that because they are not in the homeless business. <laughs> well, you need to be because if you call yourselves Christians, you are not doing what God asks of you. Do unto others as you would have done to you. And this is not right. 
need people to do this to me. Tell them is to, uh, make them go to the bathroom in the alleys, in the streets. Do the same to become criminals for this. Yet they won't make them. I need it. No, I Anybody's trying try to talk me out of doing what I did, just confirm that I'm doing what God wants, God's will to help beyond belief. Amen. He has been, everything I've done, I try to do it for God's will. And if it Amen. didn't work, it, it, it wasn't in His will. It doesn't matter if it, it's sitting there waiting for my, my vehicle to break down or or to fix it. The, the Free Will Baptist Church the kind of family came up to me and said, hey, we got this minivan you know, uh, that you can have if you want it. I was a priest on it. when they drove. So it's like, yeah, so we lived in a broken van for a while. Then we, I went to a revival at the uh, Harvest Church and it was so dynamic. <laughs> The speaker said, if you're going to do something for God, don't just think about it. Do something. Make it known. So the next day I went out and had business cards filed, printed up, brought it up, homeless ministry, Turlock's advocate. So people you know, knew what I was doing and why I was doing it. We, we were getting pretty well organized. Then I had my stroke, and I'm in the hospital. I'm in a hospital for one week. Then I go to the Turlock, uh, Riverbank, Nursing Home School. So I'm there in a wheelchair. And I, I tell the therapist that I'm never going to recover from this you know, if I'm staying in this wheelchair. So can I use a walker? And he goes, yeah, if you, if you have, have one, so let me approve it, make sure it's adequate. So I call my dad had him bring his walker because he just got out of uh, surgery from a, uh, or convalescent from a pulmonary embolism. So he was in the hospital for a while. And I'm, I'm there the first week and I tell the therapist, I'm going to go to church. There's a church down the street and I'm going to walk to it. She says, well, you're going to have to have somebody escort you because you cannot go out there by yourself. So I called the church up and they sent the deacon to uh, do it, you know, what it's going to entail. And he met me on Sunday morning and escorted me to the church. When they had their communion, I walked down the aisle, put the walker to the side, and went down the aisle and knelt to take my communion and walked back. It was a little harder getting up than it was. But that was my second week in the convalescent hospital. And God just said, these are the things you need to do to you know, improve. He said, I don't want to run this not this nonprofit organization. So, so, you know, it's not for me. He said, "Don't worry, just start it, Robert. Just start it, and I'll put the people in to run it." And he has every everything that I've donations. Uh, my vehicle has been donated by the people from the churches. This was in 2014. The gentleman that I started taking care of, I used to follow him limping with my <laughs> um, dead leg, basically, because my whole right side, um, when I was going to neurologist, <laughs> that's when I got the van during that time. And then people gave me the van, that was probably 2014, 15, 15, 16. And it's just unstoppable. People know that when I'm there, they're going to be treated fairly. I, you know, they need to have paperwork for Social Security to fill out. They need um, just somebody there to help them with their welfare and going to doctors. So that's, that's what I, I was doing, was you know, constantly going, 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 helping people get to point A to point B, helping them with their paperwork. Even just sitting there being encouraging. Just, you, know, you can do this, you know, Maybe you need to approach it a different way. So let's reword what you're saying to these people. So it, it, it's not going to happen. Don't give it life. Just give it reality. You know, I'm going to do this for me. I can't help myself unless I help myself. 
Everybody has a hidden agenda if they know it or not. Because human beings are opportunists. Yeah. And so, um, Brother well, Robert, I, I just yes, wanted to just kind of jump in. So, one of the things, and, and I think you, you missed this part, but when he became homeless, he prayed and asked the Lord, you know, uh, like, what happened here, right? And I think, you want to share about that, how the Lord spoke to you and he said, you can't, what was it? You can't serve the homeless if you don't know what it is to be homeless, right? You can't help them unless you experience it. And I have prayed for housing, and I, God has given me housing. I've asked, you know, I, you have to be very specific in what you ask for. I asked him, you know, if somebody wants me to be housed, have them approach me. When the uh, person is from the church, they went to me and said, hey, I can't afford this house that the pastor's mother is taking care of. But, uh, you know, if you can pay half the rent, you know, we can share uh, the house, the three bedroom, and um, it's in Denaire. So I pray to God and said, you know, they, they, they'd come up to me. But I wasn't specific on how long. I should have said, can I, you know, for years, for my lifetime. And I was still doing my homeless ministry from Denaire. Because being around homeless people, there's so much mental illness. That you should not. Help let become mentally ill when you're pushed aside, downcast, rejected as a human being because you're homeless. When you should be there being treated fairly and like, what can we do to help you? What is it do you need? Because each and every person is different. You can't say, oh, we have one thing and this is what's going to help the homeless. And that's what they did when uh, before the COVID thing. I was on two... Uh, homeless committees from the uh, city hall, and I explained to them, you have four districts here in Turlock, you're going to have to have four different camps. A lot of them don't go to the services down in the south and west of Turlock. They're here on the Gear Road. They're staying in the Gear Road. They don't, do, they don't go venturing off to get their mail there. They have somebody else up here to get their mail. Or services. They just you know, they'll do without instead of trying, you know, walking the three miles to the, to the uh, Samaritan Foundation. Yeah. So it gave, gave me a feel of knowing how difficult it is. We even did the homeless challenge with the city hall. Uh, do the homeless challenge. Go 72 hours being homeless. Put yourself in their position and then then decide, is this right for them? Are we treating them fairly when you have no bathrooms at 5 o'clock, 6 o'clock in the evening? They close them, they lock them. Where is that fair? They, they, there's no resources for them. They can't even turn their phones in. They, they do it downtown where they, cause they have lights in the trees. So there's a little outlet. So that, you know, during the daytime, a lot of them will go there and charge their phones. The most was a coffee house that was helping the homeless by giving them a free cup of coffee and letting them charge their phones. Um, and then even the, they, the city didn't like it, so they threatened them to find them if you continue to let the homeless people around. You know, it, we just don't want them here. And the, you know, they, just jump in, Robert, just for a quick, real quick here. And so, yeah, so. Uh, can you, first of all, a couple of things. Can you hear the passion in his voice that he has for the homeless? These are people that, I'm just telling you, it is a very difficult group to work with. And there's a lot of churches that, don't, you know, just it's just a difficult group to work with. But that's what has, uh, Robert's whole mindset is. But, you know, one thing is this, is that just stepping out, God says to step out, he'll step in towards us. If we draw near to God, he will draw near to us. If we give, he will give, right? And so... Yep. What really struck me was this, is that it was almost like the little boy who had the two fish and the five loaves. You said that you used to be on yesterday's little social security check. How many people? 78 people at the Denny? Yeah. I'm not sure that name, but that's plus tax. So that's uh, yeah. $140, $150. Wow. Well, and, praise the Lord for that, though. And so, again, just, you know, by chance, I was just out there today because I asked them, hey, uh, do you need anything from the Lord? And, 
and he said, we need five groups. And so some of some other things, and so I got to go over there and see him, and, you know, they were working on his truck, and they were getting some things, and I asked him, they got it all, you know, tightened up, and he's just out there, and he's just so passionate for the homeless, and so uh, thank you for sharing, brother. We're going to uh, continue to lift you up, and not only you, but the, the ministry up in prayer. And uh, right. it's really is encouraging, you know, just to, to do that. That's a hard calling. It is, and I, I don't see it letting up too much, much, you know, soon. Even though I'm 62 years old, disabled, with a bad, with a no hip, <laughs> rubbing uh, bone on bone, and suffering a stroke, um, my balance isn't as good as it used to be. But that doesn't stop me. But I don't take any pain medication because uh, I, I need to be in touch with what's happening with my body, no matter what. My, I was using a walker when I first was disabled, and my sister prayed for me for healing, uh, to, to heal me to, to the best you can, God, so I can continue to do what you want, your will, and helping people. That's, Amen. That, and that'll be our prayer tonight. Amen, brother. Thank you for sharing. Okay? Thank you. And so, uh, amen. And so we got a second testimony, and it's our brother Todd. And so he hasn't been on for a while, but I know he's, uh, he's going to give us a little update. And so, Brother Todd, can you just kind of share maybe how you came to faith and what you're involved in, how the Lord rescued from that, and what you're doing for him now? All right. Okay. Um, I'll try to make this quick, but I want to hit on major um, points or major events that happened in my life that were very significant because the Lord's been really showing me my past and why I came to faith. Um, so actually, like uh, I was born in Japan. My mom moved to the U.S. when I was three um, because I had autism. But, you know, I went back to Japan from time to time. Um, and now looking back, like my mom was really a witch. Like she was definitely a witch because she when when I was younger, she said that, um, you know, we we celebrated Halloween. I she read me a lot of folk tales and witch stories. And uh, one time when I was very young, um, my mom took advantage of me sexually in the shower. And um, for a very long time, though, like I repressed this, I suppressed this and I didn't want to revisit that experience. But I remember specifically from that point on, like something about my sexuality, something about my personality was never the same again. And um, and I remember as a child, like my mom would take me to these like Japanese Christian churches and uh, she was like, she had great relationships with people in the church, but she was like, I'm never going to be a Christian because they're like not, they're anti celebrating Halloween, they're anti LGBTQ, they're anti abortion. And, um, and so she really knew the Bible very well, but she was always like super against it. And I remember that when I was growing up, like she told me like, oh, because you have autism, you're never going to be able to play sports and therefore you're never going to become a man. So she really discouraged me from becoming a man, you know, and I and one of the things in first Corinthians six, if you read it, is that it says the feminine is not going to inherit the kingdom of God. And that's the witchcraft that was done on me as a child. And um, actually recently, you know, like as I've been talking to my mom over Zoom and stuff, like um, she's coming closer to the Lord. Like uh, it's praise the Lord. Like, you know, she's admitted she's a sinner. But the problem is that like the whole thing with the mask and the vaccine, like she, she really wants me to get the mark of the beast. And I've been warning my mom, hey, you know what, if you're going to continue in your witchcraft, if you're going to continue doing whatever thing that you're going to do, like you're going to, you're going to get the mark of the beast. So anyway, so, so the Lord's been showing me a lot about that, but you know, but that's kind of how I was raised up, you know, and my, my grandmother Okay, so my grandmother is like the high ranking witch of the family. And so her family was very greedy and hungry for money. And that's a common, that's like super anti Bible because it says in First Timothy that the love of money is the root of all kinds of evils. Um, you know, so my dad, when she was growing up under my grandmother, um, my dad was never treated as a great and a precious image bearer of God, but rather an obstacle that they needed to overcome through money. And, um, and, you know, I remember like my younger brother loved my grandma and he was creating all these sorts of like potions, these witchcraft potions. And uh, my grandmother became very happy when I used to, when, when like my younger brother and I used to watch the show called The Devil. And it made my grandma super happy and my mom super happy. And that was really weird. And I remember like as a young child, a fight broke out between my, my dad and my mom. 
And my grandmother, actually, after that whole fight broke out between my mom and my dad, my grandmother did a witchcraft spell, and she bowed down to this idol. And I remember there was a demon in that idol when I was very young. Um, and I, I believe that my, my mom, my grandfather on my mom's side um, died because um, died of stroke because of all the witchcraft that my grandmother and this is on my dad's side was doing and um and i remember specifically after coming back from um, my grandmother's home that i had this strange experience at school like um when i came back to the us where i touched this stick and basically um i i had this encounter with the devil like the devil like literally i i, I sent satan taking away my identity my personality my whole being was being stolen from me and I didn't know what it was, but um, an angel of the Lord spared me, but I don't want to get into too much detail because, um, but anyways, that was, that was like my upbringing, but the Lord was very great because I remember like there was the, my brother's kindergarten teacher, her name was Miss Kathy and she would always take us to church. And that's where I first learned about like um, Adam and Eve, Jesus, uh, uh, Noah's Ark and Jesus on the cross. And so Miss Kathy planted a seed in me but my mom got very upset at her. And I don't know, like ever since then, I haven't met her, but um, yeah. So at the age of 12, um, I started to um, become very violent. Um, I was breaking my younger brother's computer, like damaging stuff at home, like screaming till the point that, you know, my mom and my family was almost evicted out of the apartment and becoming very violent with the police. And so my mom sent me to this behavioral therapist and this behavioral therapist said that I deserve to be locked up in a mental institution for the rest of my life. And um, at that point, I was suicidal. So I became even more suicidal. And I remember after having this like counseling session with him, like this counselor and I, we got very violent with each other. And then um, I, he threatened to call the, um, the mental institution to come pick me up in the police. But anyways, I biked away. And I thought that somebody was going to come chasing after me because I was suicidal and somebody would like a police would come and pick me up and say don't commit suicide but nothing happened. And so I was really planning to commit suicide at the Palo Alto Baylands. And I remember what stopped me was the beauty of God's creation. So God spared my life then, you know, because if I killed myself back then, you know, I would have been burning in hell under eternal conscious torment for the rest of eternity. And so that was, so praise the Lord. But, you know, after, after I had this experience, you know, I started to like do so much sports to kind of like soothe my like pain, you know, like to numb my pain. So I did a lot of soccer, wrestling, swimming, and I like to do these intense sports so that I wouldn't think about the pain, the internal pain that was inside. But it, these things like never satisfied me. And um, I remember um, I went into homosexuality. I used to watch gay pornography three or four times a day and I went into the new age movement. And one day I, as I was doing that, um, um, this Christian Japanese American ministry called Eden Media starts to pop up on my YouTube channel. And um, one of the things that they did was show me the scriptures. And um, one of the scriptures was Matthew 5, 28, which says, if you look at another person, you've already committed like adultery within your heart. And I also remember like first Corinthians, like uh, chapter six, verses nine through 11, which condemns homosexuality. And I got very offended. And I told God, like, God, like, if these things are really sin, like, I'm, I'm going to like throw away the Bible. I want nothing to do with you, God. And I ran away from God. And when I did that, like one day, God, the Holy Spirit pulled my spirit out of my body and literally showed me the gates of hell. He literally showed me the gates of hell. And I remember it was very scary, but more, but most importantly, when I saw the gates of hell, like I knew that I deserved to be in hell because of my own sins. Like I knew that I was a sinner and that God was holy at that point. And um, after the Holy Spirit um, took my spirit back into my body, I fell flat on my knees. I repented of my sins. And, um, and, I, and when I repented of my sins, I saw a vision of, the, and of Jesus and the Holy Spirit talking to each other about me on the throne of God. And at that point, I never knew about the Trinity. I never knew much about the Bible, but I knew that, wow, like Jesus has a plan and a purpose for my life. 
And then the Holy Spirit came into my spirit. The first thing that I noticed is that my dead spirit came back to life through this electric shock. And then I felt the peace of God, this rivers of living water. And the first thing I noticed about the Holy Spirit is that he's pure. Like I've been contacting demons and new age, new age, like stuff like that. But like, but the Holy Spirit was very pure. And the purity of the Holy Spirit was the first thing I noticed when I got born again. The next thing that I noticed was that he's life. Then the last thing that I noticed was that he's love and peace. And um, one of and when I started to walk with the Lord, you know, I didn't have a Bible on me. So I went to my new age teachers, my progressive Christian teachers and um, and people like that to try to give me an explanation of like what just happened to me. But, you know, um, but, you know, thank God, like God led me to you, Brother Jesse. And man, like I started to read the Bible and, um, and man, like that was like, when I read the Bible, I'm like, man, this is the God whom I encountered when I, when I, when, when I repented of my sins, like the Bible was like the light to my feet. The Bible helped me understand like, wow, what I experienced is true. And so I started to go into Christian apologetics and man, God strengthened my face, faith. And, um, yeah, one of the difficult things, though, when I started my Christian walk was surrendering something that was very precious to me. And that was my love for studying the Japanese language. God said to give that up and study his word. And so I did for a year. And then I got my hands on a Japanese Bible. And so so God is so good. Like anything that you surrender to God, God will like um, bless you with more, you know, like Job. Um, but th that's kind of what it is. And currently, you know, um, I'm... Um, in, I'm serving um, SOS Ministries and um, Christ Forgiveness Ministries, San Francisco. Um, SOS and CFM have joined up. Um, CFM, Christ Forgiveness Ministries, was founded by Pastor David Lynn, and um, he encourages many young people, many young street evangelists like me. And, um, and man, like, it's so good. Like, God is so good. And today, I just wanted to share my testimony because man, like God has pulled me out of like, out of witchcraft, out of like homosexuality, out of new age. And, and man, like, like I could not save myself out of all that stuff. But man, like now I have Jesus in my life and I'm the happiest guy ever on this planet. Praise the Lord. <laughs> wow. That just looks like a rocket ship. Thank you brother for sharing that. One thing that you can share, but uh, uh, I'm just going to kind of jump in a little bit because I just thought it was so touchy because look at this it, it wasn't just the homosexuality those are the fleshy sins it was worse than that it was a spiritual adultery it was the new age which teaches that you are God right I that's the new age that. comes to teach right and then witchcraft all of that that's spiritual adultery of God and what does he do God the Holy Spirit comes down and grabs him by the hand and says let me show you where you're headed and he sees that, and he sees the gate to hell. He goes, no, 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 I don't want to go there. But because it's called the Holy Spirit, he brings that conviction that he knows that he deserves that because what he's doing. And so he gets on his knees and he repents. And so now God leads him to the real God. And so now, he's, you know, he gets a hold of, you know, the, the ministry, and he's reading the Bible and all those different things, and he catches fire for the Lord, right? But here's the thing that he didn't share, but I'm just going to share this. It's kind of personal. I hope it's okay. Oh, that sure. The Lord pulled him also out of homosexuality, and then he told him this. He spoke to his heart, and he said, I, I'm going to give you a wife, and your wife is going to be great, which I don't think Todd has met her yet, but that's her name, and he said, no, I've I gave her, her the but, name Grace. But, yeah, I've met her. Oh, you did? Like, oh, okay. Yeah, but that's like, new. Okay, and she's great. a Christian. Like, she's really a Christian, and her family's like a really like devout Christian, but like the Lord hasn't like, um, well, I have friendship with her, but it's not like the Lord saying like, get engaged now. And we're in two completely different ministries. So yeah, just, just saying, yeah. Yeah. Well, praise the Lord. But I guess when you first share that story, he has said something like her name is Grace. Cause I want you to always remember that she's a gift for me to you. That's how good God is. He completely takes us like a prodigal son. And just, you know, we come back with our stories, you know, and meet us that he just runs to us. He washes us. He cleans us. He says, hey, this is my son. Put shoes on his feet. Put a robe on him. Put a ring on his finger. Because this is my son, and he has returned back to me. And there is rejoicing in heaven. The Bible says that there is more rejoicing over one sinner who repents than 99 righteous. 
And I just thank God for Brother Todd. He is just so uh, full of passion when he reads. And just, it's God, the Holy Spirit. And, Amen. you know, this is some other things. But I thank you for sharing tonight, Brother. And I also thank Brother Robert. You can hear the passion in Brother Robert's voice uh, for his God and for the ministry that he serves on. We thank the Lord for that. And so uh, I'm just going to go ahead and close this all out on prayer. And again, just thank you for sharing. And each one of us will be sharing. So everyone that's on the call that hasn't shared their testimony yet, you will be sharing. And I just thank God because it's just really just sharing both Robert and Brother Todd and their passion for what the Lord has given them. Uh, just encourage me. You know, there's times where I'm working with the, especially the suicide line, that's the hardest one. And I get discouraged. And I do, there's sometimes I don't want to take the calls. And I do sometimes. I just take them because I know the Lord's watching. But it's not out of that joy that they're having. And so that's something I'm missing. And so you guys can pray for me for that. But let me go ahead and just uh, close this all out in prayer. 